Israel. Great to see you guys today. Let's stand and let's sing of the God who's for us. We won't fear the battle. Sing it out. We won't fear the battle. We won't fear the night. We will walk the valley when you by our side. You will go before us. You will lead the way. We have found a refuge only you can say. Sing with joy. Sing with joy now. Our God is for us. The Father's love is a strong and mighty fortress. Raise your voice now. No love is greater. Who can stand against us if our God is for us? Awesome. Even when I stumble, even when I fall, even when I turn back, still your love is sure. You will cheer me on with a never-ending grace. Sing with joy now, our God is for us. The Father's love is a strong and mighty fortress. Raise your voice now, no love is greater. Who can stand against us if our God is for us? separate us from his love. Sing it out. Neither height nor depth can separate us. Hell and death will not defeat us. He who gave his son to free us holds me in his love. Neither height nor depth can separate us. Hell and death Will not defeat us. He who gave His Son to free us holds me in His love. Sing with joy now. Our God is for us. The Father's love is a strong and mighty force. Raise your voice now. No love is great. Sing with joy now, our God is for us. The Father's love is a strong and mighty fortress. Raise your voice now, no love is greater. Who can stand against us if our God is for us? Great to see you guys today on this beautiful Sunday morning. Is there any better place to be? No, not at all. Thank you for the answer from the two of you that agree with me. No, certainly there is no greater place for us to be in the, the presence of the Lord with God's people. And we're going to sing of his holiness now, a, a song that is hopefully familiar to us from 1 Samuel chapter 2. There's no one like the Lord. There's none beside you. See of his holiness now. See now. There's none holy like the Lord. There is none beside you. There is no fortress like our God. Who was and is and is to come. The beginning and the end. Son of God, the Son of Man. There is no one like you, Lord. So holy, 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 holy is the Lord of glory, glory, glory to the Lord Almighty, so worthy, we give you all the praise, the Lamb of God, your holy. There's none holy like the Lord. There is none beside you. There is no fortress like our God, who was and is and is to come. The beginning and the end, Son of God, Son of Man. There is no one like you, Lord, so holy. Glory to the Lord Almighty, so worthy, we 
give you all the praise, the Lamb of God, your holy, 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 holy Lord God Almighty, worthy, worthy, worthy. is he to be praised. It's a joy to sing with you and to gather again on a Sunday. Well, you might have noticed we hired um, a modern artist to come in and do some, do some work, so that's to bless you. Uh, just kidding. I came in here at about 8 o'clock because I don't live too far. Uh, I came in here about 8 o'clock last night, and this place was covered in plastic, and I texted Joe and Jonah, and I said, guys, are we good, you know? <laughs> Um, they said, yeah, they've got 12 hours or whatever to get it ready. But we've had some, uh, some guys in here painting, as you can see. Uh, we're, we're still working on it, but we're excited uh, to just keep transforming uh, the worship center. But we know it's not about the building, is it? It's about uh, the people. The church is the people, and we're grateful uh, for, for this place to meet. But um, I'm more, uh, more excited that you're here to worship together uh, with us. Well, I've just got a couple of announcements uh, this morning. The first is we do have a church family meeting on October 23rd. Mark that down in your calendars. October 23rd at 5 p.m. right here at the church, uh, church family meeting. And that will be a time for us to gather to talk about what's coming up, um, to hear what God's done, and just to be together again um, on October 23rd at 5. So put that down. Uh, make sure that you, you're, you're there for that. As well, uh, following each service today, following this service and the second service, uh, we're going to have a, a meet and greet with the pastors. So maybe if you're new here or you haven't been able, I haven't been able to meet you or Joe or others, uh, we'd love to, to meet you. We're going to be just upstairs right when you come in, go upstairs to the fellowship hall, and we'd love to just introduce ourselves and um, answer any questions that you may have um, about Redemption Hill. And then thirdly, at this time, I'm going to ask all the small group leaders, if you're a small group leader, and I think I texted most of you, come on up here just real quick. We want to just give you a visual um, of those who are leading um, the small groups. And I think there might be only a couple uh, here in the first hour. Well, obviously, we have Joe and Aaron. Jo <laughs> come on in. Come on in. The water's fine. Um, yeah, come on. Uh, yeah, and Bible studies, I should say that too, sorry. Small group slash Bible study, there you go. Um, and we just want to give you a visual of those who um, are, are, are helping lead some of the studies and the small groups that are going on in our, in our church. We've got women's Bible studies kind of happening down here. We've got uh, Joe on men's ministry, women's Bible study, and then the Worthingtons down there. Um, they have a small group at their home uh, in Newcastle. And, and and we'd love for you to be involved. You should have gotten an email from me. I believe that was early last week, maybe the week before. Um, and if not, you can definitely go on our website and look up small groups. Um, but there are, hey, how are you? <laughs> Everybody just come on up. <laughs> um, this is a really, really small group right here. Um, 
So we got <laughs> we want to cover all ages. Um, well, hey, we uh, but again, we want just just to get a visual of what what God's doing. We're excited to to even break down the church into smaller ways and to be able to meet during the week and to have opportunities to fellowship and to dive into God's word together. So um, at this time, what I'd like to do is actually pray for our leaders, and then uh, we're going to go to scripture reading. Let me pray. Lord, so grateful for um, the way that you are working in Redemption Hill Bible Church. Lord, grateful for um, just your people that you have brought. Lord, you are the great shepherd. You are the capital S, Shepherd. You are the one caring for your people. And yet, Lord, you allow us to be part of your plan, Lord, to care and to love and to dive into the word together. And so, Lord, I pray. Pray for these leaders. Thank you for them. Thank you for providing them to this church. Thank you for the way that you've worked in each heart here, um, for a desire to open their home or to open um, up a a time to study your word. God, I pray that you would bless them uh, this 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 fall as we continue um, to want to know you more. Lord, I pray, that, I pray that just for our entire church. Let us press on to know you. Lord, in knowing you, we can have a, a big view of who, who you are. And Lord, then everything else will fall into place. So Lord, we trust you uh, for this fall. We thank you for the ways that you're working. I pray in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, guys. Well, if you've got your Bible... Love for you to open up uh, to Titus chapter 3. Titus chapter 3. And as you do, would you stand? We're actually just going to finish um, this little letter. We'll read all of chapter 3 this morning. Titus 3, it says this. Remind them to be submissive to rulers and authorities, to be obedient, to be ready for every good work, to speak evil of no one, to avoid quarreling, to be gentle, and to show perfect courtesy toward all people. For we ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, led astray, slaves to various passions and pleasures, passing our days in malice and envy, hated by others and hating one another. But when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared... He saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ, our Savior, so that being justified by his grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. The saying is trustworthy, and I want you to insist on these things so that those who have believed in God may be careful to devote themselves to good works. These things are excellent and profitable for people, but avoid foolish controversies, genealogies, dissensions, and quarrels about the law, for they are unprofitable and worthless. As for a person who stirs up division, after warning him once and then twice, have nothing more to do with him, knowing that such a person is warped and sinful, he is self-condemned. When I send Artemis or Tychicus to you, do your best to come to me at Nicopolis, for I've decided to spend the winter there. Do your best to speed Zenus, the lawyer, and Apollos on their way. See that they lack nothing, and let our people learn to devote themselves to good works so as to help cases of urgent need and not be unfruitful. All who are with me send greetings to you. Greet those who love us in the faith. Grace be with you all. Well, I'm going to invite those to come forward. We're going to take our offering in just a second, and I'd like to just pray for the remainder of our service. Let me pray. Lord Jesus, Lord, I'm reminded by that text, just the work you've done in my own heart. Lord, that I was once foolish, disobedient, lost, and yet you rescued me by your grace, by your mercy. Lord, that's true for every single person in this room that has been redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ. And we praise you for your kindness. Lord, I also am reminded in those those words from Paul to Titus that we are to devote ourselves to good works. Lord, that we don't want to be unfruitful. So Lord, I pray. I pray for this service, Lord, that it would not be unfruitful. Lord, knowing that your word does not return void, I pray, God, as the word is preached this morning, Lord, that we would be attentive, that we would listen to the voice of you through your servant, Joe. 
God, you are so kind to provide places like this to worship, to bring us together each week, to allow us to worship freely, Lord, as we recognize that there are many today that don't have that freedom. God, we pray for, as I think of it, Lord, the persecuted church around the globe. God, I pray that you would do your right and perfect will in the lives of those who don't have this freedom this morning. And so, Lord, I pray, pray for us even now as we sing. Lord, allow us to be reminded of who you are, of what you've done for us, and allow us to praise you with hearts that are true and devoted to you. And I pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated as we take our offering and continue to worship the Lord. As Pastor Shea even mentioned in his prayer for our small groups and our leaders, the desire is for us to grow in our knowledge and our understanding of who God is. And we're going to sing of that now. We want to know God and know more. to quell my hopes to raise but what I need your word has said is ever only Jesus you guide you live you reign you plead there's love Just 
our gaze upon the beauty and splendor of your son, Jesus Christ, our King and Lord forevermore. Father, may you be praised, may you be honored with our worship to you today, every day, this week, this year, God. We lay our lives down before you because of what you've done, because of your grace, God, that has saved us from our sins, from its power, from its presence, and from the penalty that would await us without you, God. We're so undeserving of your love and kindness to us, Lord, and that's why we can sing those words, because when we look to your son, there's a beauty and there is an amazement that we can't fully understand, God, that you would look upon sinners as us and save us. 
Father, we love you. We thank you for our time together, even singing these songs. And now as we transition, as we open up your word, speak through our pastor, and let your Holy Spirit convict our hearts to lead us and, and guide us and show us um, and just remind us of our need for you daily, God. We need you, Father. We pray in your son's name. Amen. Kids, you may be dismissed to your classes and greet someone next to you, find someone new, and we'll begin the sermon in a moment. We could uh, grab a seat, if you would. There we go. So good. I love it. Good morning. It's good to see you guys here. Up in Adam this morning. Ready to dig into God's Word. If you are new here, if this is your first time, thank you for coming. Thank you for being here. And I just want to welcome you uh, this morning. We, we keep things fairly simple. Uh, we sing. We take an offering. We preach God's Word. We fellowship. We're kind to one another. We shake hands. We smile. And uh, we, uh, we don't try to do anything crazy. Just keep it simple. And so part of that is, is opening up God's Word and spending time in God's Word because the avenue by which God speaks to us is through the Word of God. And so we open it up and we study it and we give uh, due diligence to it. And so we want to do that this morning. I do want to say this, uh, how much I appreciate both 
uh, Jonah and Shay so much, and hopefully you guys appreciate them too, uh, the way that they are leading uh, in the various ways that they are, and so thankful that I get to go to work with them uh, throughout the week, and we enjoy one another so much, we enjoy ministry together, and uh, uh, I just want to let you guys know how much I appreciate both Jonah and Shay, and again, hopefully you guys do as well. Turn to 1 Peter, if you would, 1 Peter chapter 3. We're making our way through this incredible letter, incredible book. Um, if you guys have jumped in uh, in some of these later chapters with me, I try to set up some context for you each and every week just to make sure that we, we understand that uh, no verse is rightly understood outside of its context, and that we say in, in biblical interpretation that context is king. Context is king. In, in real estate, it's what? Location, location, location in Bible interpretation. It's context, context, context. And if you take a, a verse out of context, you can make it say whatever you want it to say. And that's not exactly how it was. We want the authorial intent. What did it mean to the original writer of the letter? And so each time we try to make sure that we give adequate context to what is happening uh, within each verse that we come across. And we, we take each verse, each section at, as a, at, a, at a time. Um, we don't want to skip around and jump around and just grab uh, our favorite verses and talk about them, um, but we just preach whatever's next, and that keeps us true to the text. And this morning, we're in a passage in 1 Peter chapter 3, uh, verses 9 to 12. The section is 8 to 12. We looked at the, the first part of, of it last week, and this week, we're going to talk about this topic is this, how to have good days, how to have good days. One of the most generic statements that we as Americans say when we leave a conversation is this, have a good day. Have a good day. You walk out of a conversation, you're like, okay, great, have a good day. And then we part and we think, hey, okay, great, I'm going to try to have a good day today. Nobody ever leaves a conversation and says, all right, hey man, have a bad day today. I hope troubles come upon you. I just hope... It's just a rough day for you today. We always leave with, have a good day. In fact, you've probably already said that this morning. You didn't even know it. Have a good day. How was your morning? It was good. We often ask each other that question. How was your day? And every male responds with this. It was good. <laughs> Is any more need to be said? It was good. It was good. We commonly say that, and even now it's become to the point where it's like, I don't know that I actually believe you right now, because the tone in which you said good was, it was good. It was good. No, it, it was good, right? We, we, we don't even know what to believe anymore when we say, have a good day, and it's responded with, with good, unless there's something to follow up with the reason why. But the reality is this, is that we all long for good days. We all want good days. We want days that are filled with accomplishment, days that are filled with ease, maybe a little bit of stress or, or little to no stress. We want days that are, that are comfortable. We want, we want to have good days, days that are satisfying. When we come to the end of the day, we want to be able to say, yeah, it was a, it was a good day today. The question then is this, how do I have good days and does the Bible address how to have a good day? How to have a good life. The Bible does answer that for us. We're going to look at this in 1 Peter. And if we don't allow the Bible to answer this question, the world will certainly answer that question for you. And the way the world answers that question of how to have a good day is this. Go and make as much money as you can so you can have as many things as you can. Because the amount of money and the amount of things that you have will determine if you will have a good day or not. Pursue money. Pursue more stuff. Pursue drugs. Pursue alcohol. Pursue a life of sexual pleasure. Pursue material satisfaction. Pursue knowledge and wisdom and just be smarter than the next person. That's how you have a good day according to the world. That's how you have a good life. If I just have that one thing I don't have right now, that will make my day better. And then you get that one thing and you go, wait a minute, I actually need the next best thing and the next best thing. Because that doesn't satisfy me. 
There's nothing wrong with wanting to have a good day. There's nothing wrong with possessions. Money is all moral. It's neither good nor bad. There's nothing wrong, wrong with wanting to be happy. The question is this. Does the Bible address how I can have a good day? How I can have a good life? What's interesting is there a man named Solomon, King Solomon. If you remember King Solomon, King Solomon was a man who spent his entire life searching for good days. He spent his life looking for ways to be satisfied. And King Solomon was a man who had more wealth than any of us would ever have. He had homes. He had ships. He had male and female servants. He had women by the thousands. He had lavish parties. He had gardens. He had, he had land. He had wisdom. He had teachers. He had knowledge. In the eyes of the world, King Solomon had everything. In today's money, it is said this, that King Solomon's net worth would be about $2.3 trillion. $2.3 trillion. And you know, I don't know what he said at the end of his life when he was searching for all these things. You want to know what he said? He said this, I hated life. I hated life. Everything you could have. All the possessions you could ever have. All the money you could ever have. And in Ecclesiastes chapter 2, he pins out all these things that he has. All these things that that he's searching for. Like an old sage writing back a, a page out of his journal. He says, this is what I searched for. This is what I had. And the conclusion is this. I hate life. I hated it. It's because those things don't actually give you a good life. The world will tell you that. Society will tell you that. The culture will tell you that. Pursue these things. That's where the good days are. The good life is. I want you to see something in 1 Peter chapter 3. In verse 10 it says this. For whoever desires to love life and see good days. For whoever desires to love life and see good days. I think we would all raise our hand if we were honest and said, I, I actually desire to love life and see good days. I think we're all there, right? I think, I think we all are saying, yeah, okay, this, this, is, this is good. Because this is actually what I desire. I want to love life. I want to see good days. Now remember this. When Peter is writing this letter, he's writing this letter to Christians who are persecuted. We can't forget that. These are Christians who are hurting. These are, these are Christians who are in distress. These are Christians who are being persecuted for their faith. They're not having good days. They're not having great days. They're waking up and... Finding out that their friend was just burned at the stake. That's the kind of days that they're having. And Peter says this, you desire to love life? You desire to have good days? This is how you can have it. In the midst of suffering, in the midst of hardship, in the midst of distress, this is how you can have it. I realize this. As I look out amongst you, that there's, there's some of you that are that are not having good days. Maybe it is a season of, of distress and hardship. But God has put that in your life right now. And it's just, it's just been hard. I recognize that, that. That we come to church and we put on our best to come to church. But deep down inside, the days are long. The nights are long. And life isn't good. Hopefully this will be an encouragement to you to reorient your thinking and to to refocus your thinking and say, hey, this is addressed for us. These are the things that we can do. Peter wants to encourage you as he encouraged uh, the, the, the original readers of this letter. He wants to encourage us all that there is a recipe for a good life in the midst of hardship and difficulty. Let's read this section together, then we'll... We'll pull out what it is that he says. He says this, finally, verse 8. All of you, this is all of us, all the believers, all of you, 
Have unity of mind, sympathy, brotherly love, a tender heart, and a humble mind. Do not repay evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, bless. For to you, for to this you were called, that you may obtain a blessing. For whoever desires to love life and see good days, let him keep his tongue for evil, let him and his lips from speaking deceit. Let him turn away from evil and to do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it, for the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are open to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. There are five actions here for us to have good days. Five actions. Last week we saw attitudes, that of humility, that of sympathy, that of brotherly love, that of a a tender heart. That of a humble mind, and now he moves from attitude to actions. And the first action is this. Do not repay evil for evil. Do not repay evil for evil. To repay means this, to give back. It's implying a debt here. The word carries the idea of obligation and responsibility for something that is not optional. He's talking about retaliation. And retaliation was strongly condemned by Jesus. In the Sermon on the Mount, in in Matthew chapter 5, in in verses 38 to 42, it says, you've you've heard it, that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist him who is evil, but whoever slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him also the other. And if anybody wants to sue you and take your shirt, let him have your coat also. And whoever shall force you to go one mile, go with him too. Give to him who asks. And do not turn away from him who wants to borrow from you. The Apostle Paul also discouraged retaliation. In Romans chapter 12 and verse 17, he says, Never pay back evil for evil to anyone. Respect what is right in the sight of all men. And Peter says it there. Do not repay evil for evil. Remember, these these Christians would want to do that. They would want to see the evil that was done to them, the injustice that was done to them, and they'd want to fight back. They would want to take an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, or a life for a life. The word evil here basically denotes anything that is lacking good, anything that is destructive or damaging, anything that is unjust. When someone is unjust to you, damaging your character, damaging your integrity, what he's saying here is this, don't let your flesh rise up and try to get even. Don't try to get even. Which means this, that you have to guard your own heart, right? Right? You have to guard your mind. You have to be under the control of the Holy Spirit. You have to be aware of your fallen fallen flesh. For your fallen flesh will always try to defend itself. It will always try to defend itself. It will always use this righteous anger as the reason why you want retaliation. This is righteous anger. It's interesting if you just look back one chapter into 1 Peter chapter 2 in verse 23. The ultimate example of this is Jesus, and Peter already mentioned this. In verse 23 it says, When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten. But what? Continued entrusting himself to the one who judges justly. He continued submitting to the Father. He continued, he continued to, to trust the plan of God in his life. In Leviticus 19.18 it says this, You shall not take vengeance, nor bear any grudge against the sons of your people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. Proverbs 20.22 20, says this, Do not say, I will repay evil. Wait for the Lord, and he will save you. Wait for the Lord, and he will save you. Don't forget either that Peter wanted to repay evil for evil. If you remember on the night when Jesus was betrayed, Peter took a sword 
and try to chop the head off of a Roman guard. Thankfully, the guard ducked, and he only got his ear. And Jesus put it back. But this is something that even Peter needed to learn. Romans 12, 19, vengeance is mine, says the Lord, I will repay. How much time do you spend, church? How much mental ram do you spend trying to repay evil for evil? How much is it on your mind? I call it mental retaliation, where you may not do anything, but you're spending so much time thinking about how everybody has it better, those who don't deserve it, and are finding out a way where they don't actually get to enjoy the life that they have. Because they've hurt you. How much time do you think about retaliation? How much time do you think about an email that that you want to send out to this person? You don't know quite how to say it, but you're going to spend hours and hours and hours. And the whole point of it is to retaliate with an email they sent you. Or a text that they sent you. Just thinking and thinking and harboring thoughts. That'll ruin your day. Thinking ill of somebody else will ruin your day. Trying to get retaliation on somebody else will ruin your day. Your mind is not set on things above. Your mind is set on retaliation. And Peter says this, I I know what's happening to you, Christians. I know what Nero is doing to you. But don't spend your time thinking of a way to revolt against him. Don't think, uh, spend your day thinking of ways to retaliate against what's happening to you. Focus on the cross. This is the avenue towards good days. Think about Christ. Vengeance is mine, says the Lord, I will repay. It's really a battle of the mind. Don't repay evil for evil. Secondly is this. The road to a good day is this. Not repaying evil for evil, reviling for reviling, but on the contrary. Be a blessing to others. Number two is this, be a blessing to others. You want to have a good day? Today? Be a blessing to somebody else. In very strong language, very clear language, he says this, but on the contrary, in the exact opposite way, A 180 degree way from you wanting to get back at somebody is this, bless them. The word blessing here means to speak well of others. To offer them praise and thanksgiving. It means this, to invoke a blessing, God's blessing upon them. This word here, blessing, it's where we get the word eulogy. And the only time we ever think about a eulogy is where? At a funeral. We speak well of people when they're dead. We spend a whole section of the funeral speaking well of that person. We eulogize them. We bless them. And this word here is in the present tense indicative. Meaning this, that we are continually, actively blessing another person. Always in the action of blessing others. When they're alive. (laughs) Now. Continually. We're not patronizing them. We're a blessing to them. You say, how can we bless others? Well, you pray for them. Pray for their welfare. Pray for their protection. Know what's going on in their life. Show compassion to them. Love them. Praise them. Thank them. Gift them. This is the Christ-like way to be a blessing to somebody else. Notice what the text says here. It's interesting. It says, bless. For to this you were called that you may obtain a blessing. For to this that you were called that you may obtain a blessing. Because... You have been called by God unto salvation, and you have received the blessing of God in your life. You are now called to be a blessing to somebody else. 
Your salvation demands that you be a blessing to somebody else. This is an optional Christian. You don't get to decide, hey, I think I'll be a blessing today. I, you know, I think I'll spend the next month, six months, a year just allowing others to bless me. You have been called, you have received the blessing of God upon your life, the greatest blessing of God upon your life, salvation. In fact, in Ephesians 1, 3 says this, that you have received every spiritual blessing in Jesus Christ, meaning this, God has poured out every spiritual blessing into your life through Jesus Christ so that you can be a blessing to somebody else. All those giftings, all those talents, all that grace that God has shown you, all the blessings that have come in to your life, especially through salvation, those are now designed by God to be a blessing to somebody else. How dare we hoard the blessing of God in our own life? This is part of being a Christian. You no longer view life through yourself. You no longer view friendships. You no longer view work. You no longer view your community as this. What's in it for me? How can I be blessed in this situation? No, you view life through the lens of Jesus Christ where you're saying this. How can I walk into a room and be a blessing to somebody? Who can I talk to? Who can I send a text message to? Who can I love? Who needs a meal? Who needs a word of encouragement? God's blessed me. I don't deserve it. I've been, obtained a blessing from God, an inheritance from God. How can I now turn around and bless somebody else? You say, well, well what about those who have shown me evil? What about those who have hurt me? This is what Paul says, 1 Corinthians 4.12. And we labor, working with our own hands. When reviled, we bless. When persecuted, we endure. You say, at work, this guy, this gal is against me. I, I just know it. They don't like that I'm a Christian. They know I'm a Christian. They don't like it. They are insulting me. What, do I, am I, what am I supposed to do, pastor? I'll tell you what you're supposed to do. <laughs> Actually, I'm not going to tell you. I'm just going to let God tell you. You bless them. You say, but you don't understand. You're right. I, I don't. I, I don't understand. I don't know. But I do know what God has said. God doesn't say repay that evil for evil, that insult for insult, that email for email. God says this, bless them. Go the extra mile. Be a blessing to others. This goes against our culture, doesn't it? We live in a me-driven culture. A self-improvement culture that's designed to focus on self. Not others, on self. This is my space, this is my routine, this is my car, this is my house, this is my money, this is my family. Don't intrude. Unless you're going to bless me, don't intrude. This is mine, and then when a hardship comes in and trouble comes in and difficulty comes in, then we just close off altogether. We detach ourselves and we just start thinking more and more about self. More and more about suffering and we shut down. We pull back. 
And this is exactly the tendency that, that those reading this letter would have done. I'm just going to isolate myself. I'm not going to be around people. I, I just get hurt all the time. Everybody's getting hurt around me. I'm just going to shut down. I'm going through the hardship. I'm just going to be by myself. And God says, no. In the midst of suffering, in the midst of hardship, the calling is the same. Bless others. This is the path back towards a good day is where you get your mind off yourself and onto others. You say, how can I be a blessing even though I'm suffering? Don't shut down. Don't pull back. What a blessing it would be to somebody else when they know you're going through a hardship, but yet you're staring out to people. How do you do that? I don't know. I, I'm just doing it filled with the Holy Spirit, and He's empowering me each day to keep, keep the focus off of myself and onto God. And you spend that afternoon not thinking about self, but going, you know what? I know somebody's struggling today. I'm just gonna I'm just gonna give them a call. I know somebody's struggling today. I'm gonna write them a letter. I'm gonna tell somebody that I love them. I'm gonna find out if there's a way. I've got extra time in my week this week. Is there somebody that needs a meal in the church? Pastor, is there somebody struggling that I, that I can just write a card to, send flowers to? I just want to be a blessing. Jesus said it very clearly, quoted by Paul in, in Acts 25. It says this, he said it very clearly, it's better to give than to receive. It's better to give than to receive. And he says this, this is it, whoever desires to love life and to see good days, whoever de desires to have a life that is pleasure-producing. That's what that word good means, a pleasure pleasure producing days this is how you have them in the midst of all this hardship this is how you have it the word life there speaks of the fullness of life a real genuine life this is how to love it this is how to have good days and this is exactly out of psalm 34 in fact let's just turn to our bibles to psalm 34 so you can see this Peter draws back on the Old Testament here, validating the very claims that he's saying. He's basically saying this to this, this the, the, these group of people who read this, and their mind would have been blown, going, Where, where'd you come up with this? Like, wh wh where'd this come from? Peter, Peter draws back to, to the days of, uh, of David. In the midst of difficulty that, that David was going through, Verse 4, I sought the Lord, and He answered me. He delivered me from my fears. Those who look at Him are radiant. Their faces shall never be ashamed. The poor man cried. They, the Lord heard him and saved him out of his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear Him and delivers them. Verse 8, O taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in Him. O fear the Lord, you His saints. For those who fear Him have no lack. The lions suffer want and hunger, but those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. Come, O children, listen, and I will teach you the fear of the Lord. Verse 12, what man is there who desires life and loves many days that he may see good? That's, that's it right there. Verse 13, keep your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking deceit. Turn away from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. The eyes of the Lord are toward the righteous and his ears toward their cry. The face of the Lord is against those who do evil to cut off the memory of them from the earth. When the righteous cry for help, the Lord hears and delivers them out of their troubles. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves the crushed in spirit. This is exactly where Peter is pulling from. He's saying this, whoever desires love life and see good days, let him keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. So number three is this then. 
love life and see good days. Number three is this, don't speak evil. Don't speak evil. Guard your tongue. Guard what you say. Control your tongue. In fact, you will know this. The spiritual barometer to the soul is the tongue. You will know the temperature of someone spiritually by the things that they say. So one guy named Vance Havener said this, When I was a boy, the old country doctor came lumbering in with his bulging medicine bag and always began his examination by saying, Let me see your tongue. It is a good way to begin the examination of any Christian. What we talk about is a good index to our character. Our speech betrays us. And Peter is saying this. He mentions this. Keep your tongue from evil. Don't speak evil of anyone. Speak the truth. This would include avoiding gossip, avoiding slander, avoiding boasting and bragging and lying, making a false promise or or a vow that you can't keep. Not keeping your word or taking the Lord's name in vain. He's saying, keep your tongue from evil. And that word there, keep, you can circle it right there in your Bible. That word, that word keep, it means this, to make someone stop, to refrain, to cease. Use your teeth as a gauge, as a cage, to lock in your tongue. Those teeth are there to lock in the tongue, to keep it from speaking deceit. C.H. Spurgeon says this, Guard with careful diligence that slanderous member, the tongue, lest it utter evil, for that evil will recoil upon you and mar the enjoyment of your life. It will mar the enjoyment of your life. Men cannot spit forth poison without feeling some of the venom burning their own flesh. And youth lips from speaking guile. Deceit must be very earnestly avoided by the man who desires happiness. A crafty schemer lives like a spy in the enemy's camp in constant fear of exposure and execution. Clean and honest conversation by keeping the conscious at ease promotes happiness. But lying and wicked talk stuffs our pillow with thorns and makes life a constant whirl of fear and shame. I wish I could write like that. That's why I quote him all the time. I just He just says it better than I do. I could ever say it. The Lord said it as simply as this in Psalm 141.3, Set a guard, O Lord, over my mouth. Keep watch over the door of my lips. We know how quickly we can, in one moment, be singing praises to to the Lord. Right here with one another, we go right out that door, and it's like right when we take foot outside the door, all of a sudden our tongue just shifts. We praise God in one moment, then we curse someone in the next moment. How can we possibly bless others when we're complaining? How can we possibly bless others when we're gossiping about them? How can we possibly bless others when we're boasting about ourselves? Lord, Guard our lips. Set a guard over our mouths. Fourth is this. Turn away from evil. Let him keep his tongue from evil, his lips from speaking deceit. And then number four is this. Let him turn away from evil and do good. Turn away from evil and do good. 
to turn away is this, to bend away or to lean out from. It means to steer clear of, avoid. And this word turn away, it's in the the aorist imperative, which means this, that you are to turn away now and do not delay. Stop doing evil today. Stop pursuing evil now. You don't run to a hornet's nest. You don't run into a lion's den. You don't see how close you can get to that poisonous snake. When you see it, you bend your route away from it. That's what it's saying. You you turn away from it. You see the evil. You know the evil. It's right there in front of you. It's tempting. It tastes good. You know that. For a moment, you think this is going to satisfy my life. And you turn away from it. You cease from doing it. And, and you pursue, as, as Peter told us all the way back in 1 Peter chapter 1, in verse 16, you shall be holy, for I am holy. And your pursuit is holiness. Your pursuit is purity. Your pursuit is goodness. Your pursuit is Jesus Christ. Your pursuit is not evil. Your pursuit is not sin. You're running away from that. You're turning away from that. You're bending your route away from evil, and you're practicing goodness. That's what it says. Turn away from evil and do good. Practicing sin is in direct proportion to your happiness. Daniel Dorini says it as simply as this. The good we enjoy follows the good we do. The good we enjoy follows the good we do. So it says in Galatians 6.10, As we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone, and especially to those who are of the household of faith. We can't expect that we're going to have great days, good days, a a life that we love when it's just filled with sin. We can't expect God to bless our days when it's filled with evil and we continually and purposely keep running back to sin over and over and over and over again and then wake up one day and go, I don't know why I'm having such a bad day every day. It could be this, that you keep pursuing the same sins over and over and over again to find satisfaction And it's not satisfying. And it's left you empty. And Peter is saying this, the path towards good days to love life is in direct proportion to you denying sin. Running from sin. Avoiding evil. And doing good. Number five is this, seek peace and pursue it. Seek peace and pursue it. Whoever desires to love life and see good days, let him seek peace and pursue it. Romans 12, 18 says this, if possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Hebrews 12, 14 says this, strive for peace with everyone. And for the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. It says two things here. It says seek peace and pursue peace. To seek peace is this. To search, to investigate, to look for ways to come to peace with other people. This word here to pursue it, it has the idea of chasing it down. You're running after the person that you are not in a peaceful relationship with. You're chasing them down as a cop would chase down a robber. It's an endless pursuit until you catch them. That's what it's saying. Pursue that person that you are hitting heads with, that you are not in unity with. Chase them down. Find them. And as far as depends on you, be at peace with them. We know this, 
that not every circumstance, in every circumstance, there can be peace. However, in every circumstance, as much as depends on you, you are to pursue peace. It also doesn't mean this, peace at any cost. Because righteousness must always be the basis for peace. Sometimes peace is not possible. Sometimes there will always be conflict. But as far as depends on you, Christian, seek it and pursue it and do everything you can within your own power to be at peace with all men. And notice this, we're seeking peace, pursuing peace. Look what it says, verse 12, for the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are open to their prayer. You're doing these things, these five action items in your life. You're not repaying evil for evil. You're blessing others, for this is what you're called. You're keeping your tongue from evil, your lips from deceit. You're turning away from evil. You're turning away from sin. You're pursuing goodness. You're pursuing peace. This is the promise. The eyes of the Lord are on the righteous. His ears are open to their prayer. This is where the Lord looks to the righteous. It's the righteous who have their prayers answered. Again, then we look to Spurgeon. As he says this, The eyes of the Lord are upon the righteous. He observes them with approval and tender consideration. They are so dear to him that he cannot take his eyes off them. He watches each one of them as carefully and intently as if they were the only, that one creature in the universe. His ears are open unto their cry. His eyes and ears are thus both turned by the Lord towards his saints. His whole mind is occupied about them. If slighted by all others, they are not neglected by him. Say that again. If slighted by all others, they are not neglected by him. Their cry he hears at once. And even as a mother is sure to hear her baby, her sick baby, the cry may be broken, plaintive, unhappy, feeble, unbelieving. Yet the father's quick ear catches each note of lament or appeal. Wow. Every cry, every lament, every appeal before the Lord as you're pursuing these things are heard by God as if you're the only one talking to Him. On the other side, in verse 12, but the face of the Lord is what? Against those who do evil. We don't have time to look into this. This idea and understanding of the face of the Lord being against those who do evil has to do with judgment. The judgment of God is upon those who pursue evil. This is the recipe for a good day. It's not found in things. It's not found in stuff. It's found in a pursuit of holiness. It's found in keeping your tongue from evil. It's found from saying no to sin and yes to good deeds. It's it's found in seeking peace and pursuing it. It's found when the eye of the Lord is upon you. We may not be able to control our surroundings. We may not be able to control our, our co-workers. 
We may not be able to control our jobs. We may not be able to control a whole lot of things around us, but these are the things that we can control. And these are the things that the Lord blesses. And this is the road toward good days. Now listen, if you're going to live like that, if you're going to pursue that, then it's going to tell us, if we keep reading in verse 13 and 14, and in verse 15, that people are going to have some questions for you. And you better be able to give a defense for your life. And that's exactly what he tells us in verse 15. But in your hearts, honor Christ Jesus as Lord, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who hears. And we'll look at that in the weeks to come. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for this reminder. Oftentimes it's hard, Lord, to think that everybody else has it better. And we're trying to figure out what everybody else has so we can have it. Thinking that if we just have a few more things, better friends, better home, better job, promotion, we had somebody else's life, that we would love life, that we would see good days, had somebody else's marriage, somebody else's job, then that, that's the road to happiness, and Lord, you're so clear to us that good days and loving life begins with us simply becoming more like Christ acting like Christ, behaving like Christ, pursuing the things that Christ pursued, which was obedience and submission to the Father. And when he was insulted, he didn't respond with insult. He came to this earth not to be served, but to serve, to be a blessing to others. What an example that is to us, to to wake up every day and to think, hey, I want to be a blessing to others. I, I, I don't want to think about self today. I, I want to serve and help someone else. That's being Christ-like, and that's the calling that you have upon our life as you have saved us and blessed us, not to hoard the blessings you've given to us, but to turn and to bless others. That's the path towards good days. To guard our tongues pursue goodness, to refrain from sin and the evil, and to seek peace whenever possible, Lord. That's what you want us to pursue. At the end of the day, it's simply just pursuing Christ in these practical ways. So help us to do that, Lord. Convict our hearts where we are wrong so that we can confess it before you, so that you might give us the grace each and every day to become more like your Son, Jesus Christ. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Joe. Let's stand and let's sing. Of the goodness of God, we taste and seen. Sought the Lord. Sing it out. I sought the Lord and answered me.
Praise the Lord, we have tasted and seen that God is good. Amen. Church, first service, you are dismissed. Have a great Sunday. If you are new and newer to the church, we have the meet and greet right now following our service. So if you guys would just head through these doors and up left into the fellowship hall, we have uh, some snacks and drinks for you guys, and you can meet some of our pastors. You are dismissed. Have a great Sunday.